welcome to the podcast. Thanks very much for having me, David. No problem. Laura, 10 seconds or less, what is it that you do? I help people to make better food choices one meal at a time. Oh, nice. <laughs> you, you def, did, did, you rehearse, did you rehearse that? <laughs> I like that. I like that. And Laura, how did you get into this line of work? Um, not from a young age. I was a kind of a late bloomer when it came to my, my career. I studied biopharmaceuticals um, from my undergrad and kind of fell into researching seaweed for a few years and kind of sparked a, a love for nutrition. I got injured, did my ACL when I was 24 and that and my current line of work, which was researching um, protein and seaweed randomly. I uh, decided then I kind of sparked this. I mean, I never really had a massive passion for anything and then suddenly something just clicked it felt like overnight and I wanted to do nutrition. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. So, mm. you know, it wasn't like I came out of school and was like, I want to do nutrition. It took a few years and I went and studied in, in Ulster, in the University of Ulster, uh, human nutrition and kind of went on from there and did my performance nutrition after that. Brilliant. Brilliant. How many years are we going back? Oh, dare I say, I went back when I was, it was 2014, I did my master's and 2018 when I did my postgrad in performance nutrition. So kind of in and out of college, you know, working for a few years, then back to studying and working for a few years. I'm probably due to go back and do some kind of postgrad or, or diploma mm. at this stage again. Yeah, like the, the hunger for continuing education, continual education is always kind of there. Um, I, I was I was the exact same when I left yeah. college. I didn't like, I did a teaching degree. I'm, a, I'm actually a okay. water teacher and design and integration graphics teacher. Um, but I, even though I completely left that and just started training people and then fell in love with the training side of it, fell in love with the yeah. nutrition side of it, fell in love with the business side of it. Um, I, I always had that hunger to learn more once I realized, okay, this is, like, I love this. Like, this is what I want to do. And I do, I do feel like I kept part of the teaching degree because that's what we do now. Like we're, we're educators as well. Like, you know, it is, yeah. Um, so it's, you know, it's good to hear those stories. So today we were chatting about diving into the topic around performance nutrition. And I think a very good way to start off with that is maybe just to talk about like, if you had like 20 minutes with a, a let's just say a, a sports team, we're not going to put a name mm -hmm. on the classified the sport, but a sports team, what would you say is the basics or what would form a basis of like a solid foundation? that you know when they left that talk that if they implemented what I just said, they're going to be 70 to 80% there if if that's possible. Yeah, I'd love if it was possible. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, I'd, I, I probably would take in that 20 minutes the same kind of stuff I would do throughout half a season. It's focusing on the real simple things. So driving home, kind of, I'd love to, to clear the cobwebs for people or, or kind of clear the mist in terms of what that team should be focusing on for performance. And when it comes to brass tacks, it's your, your foundation, the bottom of your, your pyramid is all, always your calories, carbs, and hydration. They're the three things that are, are going to really impact performance on the day and performance throughout the season. Obviously, we move up the pyramid then or move up the, to the less um, fundamental or vital things, but still key areas. But definitely where I see team sport athletes kind of getting confused or, or not quite focusing on our your calories in versus calories out, making sure that you're fueling the actual, the training session, the matches. Players often go straight to supplements and, mm -hmm. and want the, the fancy things. But straight away, first thing I say to players is you need to focus on your carbs on training days and match days. They're your priority, your overall calories in versus calories out players. And, you know, again, we're not going to talk about specific teams, but team sport athletes constantly show, especially at amateur level, that they don't, get the correct calories in throughout the day that they're they're constantly under fueling and not mm. quite hitting the mark so that's what i would focus on firstly then carbs getting hydration right as well a lot of team players think that their their hydration's exactly where it needs to be it turns out that's some more often than not it's not quite there so re refocusing that even though they think they are getting there refocusing them on their hydration their rehydration as well afterwards and yeah, that, that's honestly what I would spend the, the crux of my time focusing on my players. And, and I would do that in that 20 minutes, hopefully. Mm, so calories, number one, really. Yeah. Um, carbs, number two. 
hydration number three, but they're all they're all as equally important as the other. Like without yeah, I, I put that in. They're all the, yeah. the, 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 the basis there. If you're not eating enough carbs, you're probably not going to be hitting the calorie targets anyway. So um, exactly. it's that double double edged sword type thing. And like when you start, like if you, let, let's just take it, a, an individual now out of that team setting, yeah. and we start to look at what they do. Uh, let's pretend you got a food log off them, and they've like kind of three quote unquote big meals and what else do I see a typical protein shake after they have their training session what would you start to look at for that individual I know it's context specific there could be numerous different things going on but like let's just hypothetically pretend we have somebody who has a decent quote-unquote decent breakfast lunch and dinner uh, and they take mm-hmm. a protein shake but we kind of know they're under fueling we know that they, they're not performing to the highest level they can where would we go from there I would straight away look at within those meals what are the what are the what's the calorie intake in that meal and what's the carbohydrate intake because often players will think I have my big breakfast I have my my lunch but we might just have a skew in the actual nutrients within those meals so for instance if hypothetically if we're taking if a player has scrambled eggs on toast in the morning time and they have some maybe rasher sausages potentially with that as well are we to focus on protein within that meal again with lunch are we ha- are they focusing on they're having big doses of protein potentially some fat along with that and the carbohydrates may just be off a bit they're thinking that oh i've had a pasta dish but is it enough within that dish have we have we got the quantity that that's required for that day outside of that do we have appropriate snacks throughout the day what what kind of snacks is that player taking in on a training day is it the high carb snack that's required is it a you know um beyond that we go with timings then as well when is that last meal had is it too far out or too near to that training session um the protein shake afterwards that wouldn't be considered adequate recovery because we haven't we haven't got a carb uh, source in there as well and Mm. something we always see i constantly see with players time in time out through very clever marketing over the last kind of decade or 15 years is that we have this massive focus on protein and Mm. i'll see players even doing that now where it's big high doses of protein on on, on training days and carbohydrates are there but nowhere near the amount that's required for a team sport athlete um so straight away i I would look to to see those amounts is the car first of all is the the calorie intake matching the expenditure throughout the day including the training session because again what we see is players kind of yes upping upping calories potentially on on training days but not maybe taking into account what they've done that day have they had a a 20k commute cycle from work have they been running around all day after their kids or are they on their feet all day at work or do they have a very manual labor stressful job where um they're on sites all day or you know it is it is just a high intensity job so that all has to be taken into consideration when you have your overall calorie intake and you have to to match that we have to match our intake with our output or else we get into the realms of underperforming underfueling um risk of injury illness burnout and then beyond that again you know are we into the realms of low energy availability and reds which is relevant energy deficiency in sports so you know there are many consider- considerations to be taken but first of all that's where i would go with that calories and carbs are your first basis um, straight away Let's touch on a bit, little bit deeper into the carbs or carb thing, because I think people like you're 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 bang on right with the protein intake. I do feel that nowadays GA players are only getting too much protein for what they actually need it for. Um, like they're way above that kind of two kilo, two gram per kilo. 100%. Per, yeah, yeah, way above it. And like you, they can get away with what one point five probably to one point eight grams per kilo if they got proper, we'll say full amino acid profile protein sources spaced the evening throughout the day. Yeah. Um, but I do feel, especially my own club mates thinking about them, they, they have that kind of down. Um, mm-hmm. Yes. The handful that will struggle with it's It's very easy to change that, but mm-hmm. carbohydrates seem to, there, I think there still is a, a bit of, what's the word I'm looking for? I call them carb phobic. Like, yes, yes, because it's it's still we're, it's still we're, really we're like carbs. Of them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, why are carbs so important? Carbs are at high intensity interval sports, sh- such as team sports. Carbs are our primary fuel source, our primary preferred fuel source. Yes, we could use 
fats at a certain intensity, but that intensity has to be, it can't be quite high. It has to be moderate intensity, but you're, you're forcing your body to use a, a secondary fuel source that doesn't really want it. It takes a little bit of extra effort, but at high intensity, you're going to, your, your body will only want to burn, use glucose as a form of energy. Now it can do that. It can use its protein source and we don't want that. We don't want it to force our body to break down our muscle, to convert it to, to, um, to have it then converted into glucose you know, it'll go through a process of gluconeogenesis. We don't want it to do that. We want to have carbs there available for our body to use. We unfortunately, and I, I mean, we, as in the greater we, the nation and, and you know, a lot, of, a lot of countries were fr- afraid of carbohydrates, again, through very clever marketing that we've been exposed to over the last number of years. Um, carbohydrates are in people's minds linked with weight gain and we don't want that. Uh, players don't want that. That's not the case. And, and you know yourself, that's not the case, but that's the mindset. A big problem that I struggle with teams I work with is pushing past that. Now, female teams are a lot, they need a lot more convincing than, mm. than the guys. The guys still need convincing. I still need to, to, to push it with them. But the women and girls I work with, it does take a lot of convincing and repeating and, and showing them the nearly taking out the, the research papers and showing them that, no, this mm. is what you need to do. Uh, we're not quite there yet. We're not, they're not convinced. Um, so it's something that I actively work on. I've just come off calls with, with group work there from, from a team I'm working with. And it's a question I got of how do I make sure that I'm not overeating carbs on rest days? So, <laughs> you know, that it's a fear people have that they're eating too many carbs. Um, even though I'm recommending that they do go for, for high carb amounts. Mm, even that thing there of carbs on rest days um even when i was what between the ages of probably 18 to 22 ish i i used to believe that after i on, on a training day whether it was a sport or the gym that i could have higher calorie days and then on the day after i had literally next to no carbs because i wasn't training and i quote unquote did not need those carbs but your body doesn't work like that it's not just a thing that like <laughs> that if you fill up the day before it's 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 automatically full the next day you have to replenish stores and whatnot Mm -hmm. and i do think it's quite sad that especially for female teams because i i see myself um yeah there is that there is that we kind of forget that even though yes these are athletes um they're still normal humans at the end of the day like we all think the same way especially with what we've been showing in the media um throughout time so like if you want to get the maximum from your performance, you need to have adequate fuel. Absolutely. What, like, and even, even that myth right there, how do I know that I'm not eating too much carbs on rest days? What, what was your answer to that? I'd be keen to hear that. I would like, so we have a protocol within when I work with the teams and it's, you know, it's the plate adjustment and you understand that it's the idea of kind of fueling for the work needed. So high intensity days, we go for the higher carb amount lower intensity days or, or, or kind of if we're doing strength training or stuff like that we bring it down and rest days we, we lower it down again and trying to explain to this and girl that she wasn't over consuming carbohydrates essentially meant that if you're I said to her if you're feeling very tired on on your rest day and you're feeling sore you need to be mindful of bringing up your carbohydrates to maybe that moderate intake so it's kind of like an amber day an amber plate day and then like trying to explain to her that she knows that she's not overeating on them, that if you don't feel like, you know, if you're not hitting those high amounts that I've recommended, like you're not filling up half your plate of pasta, you're not overeating on carbohydrates. And and trying to highlight that to her is it's incredible, you know, and I've get, like with my players, they'll all get sample rest days, sample moderate days and sample um, high training days. And, and I'm trying to direct them to, to follow those recipes. But it's that fear and and like I'm trying to get players not to too much overthink it go to the other way is 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 key as well so just Mm. essentially it's it's about reassuring like I would have I reassured her that she's not going to overeat because unless she's eating like a training day essentially she won't be overeating um on carbohydrates Mm. so and it is that that, like even if she did matter yeah, it doesn't exactly. matter. That's exactly. Like, like, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Even if you over it, it's like trying to and explain to him, it's you need to do it on a long period of time. And that's essentially where we get into the, the calorie imbalance of overeating and then seeing potential mm. body fat gain. And you're nearly kind of wary of saying that to players as well, because as soon as you mention body fat gain, 
you know it's mm. oh, don't do that and yeah. It, it's it's very like you said about we, we kind of chatted before about it's about that it's the emotional intelligence nearly that you have to be very it's not about numbers a lot of the time with players it's you have the recommendation there but you've got to take each person and be very some of them you should be very delicate with some of them you can be a little bit more direct mm. in terms of their eating but it's it, you have to strike a balance with people because it's so personal to them and you have to understand where they're coming from with their food kind of ideology and, and food approach Yes, 100%. Like we still, whenever I did work with teams or even individual players, because we, we do get a lot of individual players from all over Galway coming to us for their own training and nutrition, um, yeah. like separate from their team, if you like. And we, even though we're trying to get them, we'll say, into a, a performance nutrition routine, we have to always really circle back around to the basic, let's say, fat loss principles and, fat, and weight gain. So like a yeah. deficit and a surplus. Because once they understand that, Fat loss or weight gain is not just a 24 hour thing. Once they realize that if you look at a whole week, yeah, it's like, ah, oh, that makes sense. I can balance things out versus yeah. a surplus. If you're if you're in a surplus for two days a week, so you're we call that overeating on calories. Mm-hmm. And then you're in maintenance calories for the rest of the week. Yes, you're going to gain weight because you're still in a surplus. And now it's the size of that surplus, which is going to determine how much weight you gained. And even for that uh, lady that you said was worried about eating too much carbs, again, it's it's not about the carbs, it's about the calories. And secondly, if she did overeat on, or had, we'll say more calories that she planned on that day, she's probably going to expand that more in her next training session, regardless, or even that day, she's probably more active subconsciously uh, because of it, because she's more energy to burn. And people don't even realize these things that are going on at the base level, but we don't, bother getting into that much because it's nearly too much stuff too detailed. Yeah, yeah you don't need it like yeah. um so there's a large yeah, there is a large part of buy-in there, there is a large part of um drilling principles and reassurance as well and i, I think these podcasts do provide that like mm-hmm. i remember one of the first uh we'll say performance nutrition podcasts i ever recorded was with um lloyd parker back one of the Five, episode five or six i think okay. i will link that up in the show notes as well but he he was everton's uh first team nutritionist yeah and we've talked about similar stuff but it's 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 never something where i'll record one performance nutrition episode and that's it done um yeah th- things stick when we hear them multiple times from different audio video visuals or 100%. um from different perspectives and all all this kind of stuff so i think um if you're somebody that still feels a bit iffy around carbs or calories and you are a sport athlete and you do have access to someone like Laura or someone like myself, reach out and just express that concern. And mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's going to reassure you that you're probably doing things. Okay. Um, because carbs are fucking important. If you want to perform at the highest level, simple as that. hundred percent. There's on the flip side, actually on the flip side, but kind of in, in the same vein, another question I've had this week from a player, and a really important one is you have players that are on the other side of things, very tuned in, very aware of their nutrition, hit their numbers, but where they struggle with carbs is that they, they know this, you know, they, they know what carbs are healthy, that they're happy to have in their diet and they're happy to have um, large amounts of these carbs in their diet. And they're hundred percent with that. But in, in sports nutrition and performance nutrition, you have the two mix of two carbs because we have the less nutritious carbs, less healthy carbs, but them car- these kind of carbs are also very effective for late stage fueling or quick refueling. And that's where some of my players will struggle as well. So they'll come and say, I'm happy with carbs. I've no fear of carbs, this carb phobic thing. But what I do struggle with is these high GI, high sugar processed foods that that's also recommended. And you look at, you look at any fueling station, the NFL in the premier league, um, you know, in, in the rugby union leagues, they will have a fueling station that will contain, you know, uh, Rice Krispie squares, jellies, Jaffa cakes, you know, soda yeah, bread, really. Madeira cake, everything. Not necessarily the most nutritious or healthy carbohydrates, but very effective for fueling. And that's something, again, another hurdle that I have to overcome with players where you just have to get some of them out of this mindset of you have to eat the most nutritious food all the time. You don't. And, you know, how you nearly explain it is you've got your circle of, nutrition for health and your circle of nutrition performance, they overlap in places, but they're still two different things sometimes. So 
if you're a player that is that does struggle with some of the recommendations like sports drinks because they're high sugar or like that jellies or jaffa cakes these foods are can be quite good for late stage fueling so in the hour to 90 minutes before match or half time refueling or indeed if you're an endurance athlete pushing past that hour to two hours to three hours these are all the foods you look to because they're quick absorbing high sugar foods mm. I like it's it's something as well that when I was younger I used to always fixate on that high glycemic and getting hung up on glycemic index yeah. and getting hung up on sugar. Now I don't even we don't even bring that into our coaching here anymore. Yeah. We don't like unless we get asked it. Like we just we kind of nearly like shut it down quick because it's not even worth our time explaining it ninety percent mm-hmm. of the time, ninety nine percent of the time. Mm-hmm. Um, like if if somebody was to see my diet in a day, like um, they might be shocked to see what I eat sometimes. Like you know, and I and, and I'm not currently back at sport until quote unquote next week but i'll still i enjoy those foods i enjoy having a massive mm. bowl of coca pops in the evening it doesn't yep. d- detract from the fact that what 70 to 80 percent of my nutrition is probably spot on uh quote unquote spot on meaning i'm getting enough nutrients and hitting my protein goals and yada yeah. yada yada um but like i think what did i have last night i had a donut a whisper and a bowl of coca pops and i'm not dead you know it's just no yeah and you enjoy them yeah exactly yeah and zero yeah. guilt attached. Um, I, I understand it took me a while to get there. I, I, I struggled like a lot of people do. I went down yeah. rabbit holes of going keto. I went down rabbit holes of going paleo as oh. much as I regret it. <laughs> same. I, I did the same. Yeah. I, I was, I was, when I got into it, like 24, when I really started looking into nutrition, I, that was, I'm sure you, it was the same time you did it. I got swept up in the whole paleo phase, like yeah. ha- half an avocado for a snack. Like what, when, <laughs> in, if you someone offered me that now, I know I'd tell them what to do with it, yeah. but that's, you know, we do these things. I, I did the same, I did keto. I, I didn't eat dairy for nearly two years, which is insane an insane mm. thing to do unnecessarily. Um, again, that's one I spent half my time making sure people understand dairy, making sure they're not afraid of it, getting, one thing I see, and this is really common, and I, I nearly kind of don't like pointing it out sometimes, but I'll do like recovery um, tasks with my my teams and fueling tasks. But one will be say, they'll put in a smoothie that they've had a recovery smoothie and, you know, they'll have, oh, I have my scoop of whey, my banana, my honey, and then my almond milk. And I'll have yeah. to question the almond milk. And I'll get told maybe because dairy they've been told dairy is bad for them and then I have to kind of say well you know the whey protein is actually dairy so we go through this little learning curve and then of course if they, within their own prog if they want to continue with you know almond milk that's absolutely fine they just have to be aware they don't get any protein in it they don't get any carbs unless it's fortified they don't get any micronutrients unlike all the stuff you get in in, in dairy milks so it is you know you kind of have to to weave in and out of these little hurdles that people seem to to yeah ideas people have or kind of misconceptions and you're constantly battling those and being and being you have an eye out for them nearly all the time because you can see where people have been either misled or, or may have like that a misconception about something did you uh, ha- when you went back are you are you eating dairy now oh yeah oh, yeah <laughs> I can eat her milk a day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> did you find any um uh, discomfort or attack on back on dairy None at all. You, you were able just to handle it straight off the bat when you were yeah, back on. I, yeah, and I would have never had an issue with dairy. I, I went off dairy because like that, this was the time, and sure you can remember this, the China study was in full flow. This whole anti-dairy thing was coming in. We were all going paleo. This was probably about nine years ago, nearly 10 years ago now. So, And I think a lot of people who who remember this, this time, will, will, especially if they were into their nutrition and were following these certain influencers that were around the time that were encouraging paleo, um and encouraging the anti-dairy movement i went but i like i, I would have had very little dairy if any over maybe cake or you know maybe cheese yeah. on, on something i don't know but i went back into when i realized how the madness of of because i loved drinking milk you know and mm. I, suddenly going from the thing thinking that this re- thing you enjoy and you felt was conducive to your health is then bad for you so i, I cut it out now i had no issue going to going back on to to large amounts of dairy and I would have large amounts of dairy at this stage because I had a lot of um, sinus issues when I was younger and um, gut issues and stuff as well but I think the gut issues were more alcohol related than anything but anyhow <laughs> when I went off the dairy like um, I was really anal about staying off it and I, I went through a phase of even yeah. trying goat's milk and I was disgusting but when I when I 
but bear in mind, I was ha- I was having a liter of full fat milk with my dinner pretty much every day, and okay. like cheese and yogurts and probably dairy throughout the rest of the day as well. So I I did find I was very caught up, very phlegmy and stuff. So when okay. I came off it, that cleared up dramatically for me, and I was kind of like, okay. oh, it was, it was like reaffirm my beliefs. Humans can't have dairy, but yeah. then obviously when um I can't remember when I went back on it, but I was a bit more conscious of the amount I was having. And mm-hmm. I'm even finding it now again lately that I'm starting to get a, a bit more f- kind of phlegmier and caught up more than usual. Be- but that's down to the fact that I have so those 500 gram yogurts, the 50 grams of protein, okay. the ones from Aldi. Yeah. I have one of them every day for the last like four, four or five years. I have <laughs> coffees with milk in them. I have cheese yeah, with yeah. every second meal. Um, but do you know, there's a trade off. It's kind of like, yeah, I, I feel a bit more kind of caught up with that. Mm-hmm. But is that due to dairy 100% due to dairy maybe maybe not but am I going to change my diet dramatically because that no because I enjoy it so much you know and yeah I'm trying to be more conscious of it like but yeah there's an issue and I'm just in relation to kind of your experience there of what I find a lot of people do is like that they'll hear and I'm just taking dairy for example yeah because it could be wheat or it could be gluten or it could be some other nutrient that they've been told causes I did all that as well <laughs> yeah that, well I'd say but oh, I was anti you know anti-gluten for it like that around that time as well until I <laughs> highly copped on to myself um but we do they people do this thing and they'll like that say they cut out carbs or they'll cut out gluten or they'll cut out bread and suddenly they feel amazing and they're mm. you know they're like I have so much more energy and um you know, I'm feeling so much better I've dropped a bit of weight but like in conjunction with that they've also started going to the gym more walking an hour a day they're maybe drinking less um they're maybe cooking at home more they've just changed a lot of other factors that have helped this along but they'll always owe it back to something else they'll owe it back to gluten but maybe they've just stopped ordering pizza every weekend and have cut back on having 12 cans of guinness on a saturday night you know there's there's lots of other things that people would love to owe to, that they've cut out a certain nutrient but in the vast majority of cases that nutrient is absolutely fine in people and mm. they've just adjusted other areas of their life and they're they're just owing it to that one thing and we yeah. need to be a little bit more kind of pragmatic on our approach to that because it, it it means that that person goes on and tells their best friend then that oh you need to cut that nutrient out of your life and people are very quick to tell people how to improve their diet from my experience yeah, yeah. <laughs> like br- bread is a big one i've i've like i've heard that a lot recently again bread, i've cut out bread and i've lost x amount of weight and <laughs> a couple of years ago i had a neighbor <laughs> lovely man but like he i remember he, he knew i owned uh jack fitness and uh mm. he'd often ask me questions about it and stuff <clears throat> and one day i was chatting to him and he was telling me how Jesus, Dave, I've cut out bread for the, like the last something like eight weeks and he's lost five or six kilos. Wow. And um, yeah, but he was still going to the pub on a Friday and having, I don't know how many pints, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and I was asking, why did he do it? And he was, it was, it was mainly because of gluten. So okay. gluten is, and, and now that he's not on gluten, he's more energy. He's sleeping better. He feels better. He's lost a lot of weight, even though, <laughs> in my opinion not to judge but he looked shocking because he just looked gaunt now he was losing <laughs> he was already very skinny like yeah okay uh, but it was just completely ironic um how he was going out to the pub and drinking points that are literally gluten full in of all... gluten <laughs> yes uh but like it, it just goes to show you like that it basically what he done was because his diet was predominantly bread <laughs> well, no, i himself... just went to ask how, yeah, how yeah. much bread was he eating a day yeah like... like he put himself in a huge deficit and yeah. uh, was probably counteracting that deficit a little bit at the weekend because he what he is fond of his points mm. um but yeah it's it's did did he lose weight because he took out gluten no he lost weight because he put himself in a massive calorie deficit and, via uh, the exclusion of of that food yes, you know yes t- it's, it's the out same that, as that um component. I had this conversation recently with someone else in the podcast as well about vegans and how when people jump on the vegan bandwagon for non-ethical reasons, mm-hmm. the reason they might, they might become healthier and lose weight is because they're a health-seeking individual now and they're looking for ways to become healthier. Is it because they went mm-hmm. vegan? Again, probably not. It's probably because yeah. you're eating better, you're eating more plants and you are eating less calories overall as a result of that. So yeah, it's, it's, it's performance nutrition or not, 
those other principles are still at play. And like, as I said, just because so many players a team sport doesn't mean that they automatically know the stuff or are um, excluded from the bullshit in the media. Like, you know, mm-hmm. um, I want to circle back around because we talked a lot about the carbs and I think we've dispelled a few myths amongst that too, which is fantastic. But if you were to give somebody some practicalities when it comes to carb intake we're saying high carb we're saying low carb we're saying <clears throat> carb this carb that mm-hmm. how would you how would you without giving you know yes you could say to me oh we require four to six grams per kilo of carbohydrates or whatever where have you any practical stuff that we could take on board without going into those numbers yeah so this is key to what i do with with teams i work with because you turn around to you know, a, a 21 year old young fella and say, actually, you should be getting 480 grams of carbs today. That <laughs> means little to me like, OK, yeah. So we don't I try as much as I, I will always highlight. These are the numbers we're seeking. This is where the evidence lies. This is what the research has told us. But for you guys, this is what it looks like in food. Mm-hmm. So I always work with literally fistfuls. Um, we don't get into the you know discrepancies of how big your hands are. But we'll just go with fistfuls for main meals. They get a list of and pictures we always work it's very much you know Hmm. picture based so they can just see the food what i'm talking about it works far better and you've very much and it's something i was lucky enough to learn very early in my career in terms of even working with anybody that don't people don't understand grams or anything like that when it comes to food the the lay person they just don't so you need to show them photos so we go kind of by fistfuls i'll always work with fistfuls so like on a match day you're going with porridge or uh, lunchtime pastas rice and um, potatoes anything like that you're going the bigger guys will always go kind of three to four fistfuls up to five on match days and um, with female athletes or smaller players we are kind of go two to three or between two and four so if they have that in their heads that okay porridge I need three fistfuls or four fistfuls of porridge on training days and maybe up to five on match days and then I put my fruit in on top like I would be confident that get they're getting upwards of 100 grams of carbs roughly it's never an exact science per meal, per meal. that's what we're aiming for so yeah. um and within that meal so that's kind of when when you give when you can go by those kind of measurements they're far from the most accurate things you're going to get but you know mm-hmm. you're in the vein of it you know you're in the right line um and then after that very much picture based stuff of you should know kind of your 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 fueling snacks are your smoothie that you're confident in that has kind of from a recipe you've seen has a hundred say 100 grams of carbs which is your banana milk yogurt some honey and maybe an apple or a pear so you have that kind of standard smoothie that you have two hours before your session that you know has high high quantity of carbohydrates after that if you do have high amounts and you struggle with your intake which i know players do especially on match day with nerves and things we would go for very simple options and liquid form of carbohydrates. So stuff that you can just keep drinking on. Um, and that works with early morning sessions as well, because you've got mm. that limited fueling window. But for practicality, um, yeah, I would I would use that that fist measurement and then having a standard shake that you'd have on a, on a training day for fueling. And snacks are based on fruit and, and cereals, granola and yogurts, things like that, with all the simple stuff that players have heard time and time again you know yeah yeah and and i think players need to understand as well they're still hitting their protein targets along with that yeah when you when you say a fist um right i'm i'm measuring out a fist of uh porridge because we know from like a quote-unquote fat loss perspective we go with a cupped handful when you say yeah. a fist i mean into the porridge container a fistful of porridge so you have so it it's, into it's, your it's kind of like not this little measly little cup thing it's like no no grab a, the good, a, good, <laughs> a good fist of it a good yeah, fist okay. and again of course we have when we do cook along to the guys we're talking about fistfuls of pasta you know my hand smaller than your hand etc but even in that you're kind of getting that individualization because y- you know for the bigger yeah. guys they're more likely going to have bigger hands and they're going to need more anyway so it, it is that the easier way if i were to tell every player just send them give them their their recommendations in grams and say, off you go, get yourself fueled up for training day. 99% of them won't do it. They just won't. But if you can give a player that's a little bit green when it comes to understanding nutrition or feels a bit overwhelmed by it, if I can tell him, look, if you have four fistfuls of porridge the morning of your match, 
that's how that's that's you're going to be fueled up in that meal and then repeat it over your next meal that's his confidence level or her confidence level gone right up something mm. she can easily or he can easily do and that it's very understandable very digestible as well kind of yes so on a non-training day is that range like what two to three fistfuls or one to two or even we switch it again we have alternatives so we're moving away from porridge or you know those carbohydrate based meals shifting it over to maybe um an omelet or you know maybe something nice like nice like pancakes you know things like this um or um toast and eggs you know we're moving slightly away from the the complex carbohydrate focus or the you know the high carb med focus and mm. it gives the players a little bit more instead of having porridge every single day which can get a little bit monotonous or, or kind of yeah, starchy pardon. cereal based every day we can have something else so we move move over to that and we, we have less again we'll go for you can have like that or you'd aim for not you can have because you can always have whatever you want but you'd aim for mm. one to two fistfuls or maybe one on the on those days and how many meals are you would you like your athletes to get you're talking three to five for I do, yeah. So I would always work with three main meals because that's again you're sticking to the standard that people know and accept and are used to have done their entire lives. We we'll go with lunch, dinner, main meal, and then anywhere in the region of four to six snacks. Then beyond that, or three to six snacks, depending on the day. Okay. Because with some players, they'll need to eat little and often coming up to a training session. Some players are happy to have kind of large snacks, small meals. We'll call them. Yeah. And and you're you're kind of showing them how to individually adapt that to themselves what suits them best yes yeah you're like a person on a personal level i love having like in my head four main meals so Mm -hmm. yeah do you want to call that breakfast lunch dinner one (laughs) dinner two um and then i I usually yeah and i'll usually have like well i don't know what you call it a snack but i call it maybe like a tree after dinner is when the popcorn the whispers are whipped out but um when i'm when i'm back playing sport four big main meals and yes i'll have a snack somewhere throughout the day just for a bit of extra fueling as well. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But even on the topic of game day nutrition, and you're saying get upwards of, we'll say four fistfuls, or just hypothetically say three, three to five mm-hmm. fistfuls, depending on the player, their position, there's all these other factors that come into it and how they feel. Mm-hmm. I like to keep what I know and what I know I can easily di- digest on a game day. And that's probably the single biggest practical tip that I would give someone when it comes to game day nutrition. Do not mm-hmm. change things just because if I can the rugby player you follow on instagram does it or whatever yeah. you know yeah. um, stick to what you know stick to what you can do and when you have a process and a routine behind that it takes nearly out the thinking of the game that day and you're just focusing yeah. on that meal at hand um yes there's days where i will feel nervous and i will be slow eating that meal but if you still stick to your routine you're still enough hours away to be slower and still be okay so yeah. um some very very good practical stuff there laura that's fantastic is there anything else you want to add on that carbohydrate front no just hydration alongside of it you, we do need you know hydration is obviously imperative anyway but remember we need water to store carbs as well so you don't want to risk high carb storage and then leading to, it leading to dehydration or anything like that so make sure that you're hydrating high on top of that mm-hmm um do you look at uh depending on the time of the, the game so if you have a morning game saturday morning game sunday morning game um what would you do on the saturday again this is something i've literally just talked about today with with players i'm, I'm dealing with a team that has a training session on friday night and a game sunday morning so saturday i am encouraging big, them big to day. use it's a it's a fueling day essentially and mm. this is where players get thrown because from literally talking to them there they're telling me that oh would have really kind of taken it as nearly a rest day so and that's not the case because early morning tr- session on on a sunday morning early morning match on a sunday morning you need to use saturday as your fueling day and pushing those meals as late as you can so nearly if you can have that high carb meal late into the evening without it affecting your sleep obviously it's kind of like a balancing act with all of this that you need to make sure that you're not sacrificing sleep to try and get more carbs in so you're 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 essentially having the meal as late as you can without affecting sleep so in the morning you're not as fasted as we'll say you would usually be and then immediately on that sunday morning you're hydrating and having a a meal that you're used to that you know is contains a quite a large amount of carbohydrates but gives you enough time before the match to digest and absorb some of them 
So that Saturday, again, really needs to be a, a considered a fueling day that nearly in, in the preparation for that match the next morning. 100%. What is, what is that... Um... What is that carb? Do you know that carb figure off the top of your head where you can refuel a completely de a completely um I was gonna say dehydrated, a completely glycogen depleted athlete in over 24 hours. They can replenish their glycogen stores over 24 hours by is it 10 grams per kilo of body or something like that? Oh yes, yeah. Yeah, but like you're not coming into that Saturday completely depleted, but you're using that Saturday as your fueling day because you might wake up the Sunday and not want to eat. Yeah. Um, and like, I know I said there, I, I tried to stick to what I know, but there is cases where personally, and I've tried this with, with our clients as well. If I genuinely cannot face a bowl of porridge the morning of the game, I'll, I'll straight away just go for something that I'm just going to enjoy and eat. And even if that's four slices of toast with a bit of jam, it'll do me, yeah. you know, oh, and it, that would, yeah, sorry. Yeah. That would be, that's again, that comes into what I've said about players that, that conception of, I need to have the porridge and that's all I can have. And mm. on the morning, what, whatever you can tolerate is that's what the appropriate fueling is. And the idea, like you said, is getting in, getting players into being so kind of routine with that match day eating that it doesn't cause you any consideration or nearly any thinking. Nothing on match day should be stressful. Match mm. day in the hours leading up should be as whatever works for you. It, it, that whole strategy has to include you know your environment your kind of being calm being focused so your food should it should never be a case on match day where you're saying geez what am I having this morning or I don't even have it in the house or maybe I need to go to the shop to get my you know to get my snacks that never comes in on match day match day you're ready to go Mm. and like you said if you wake up on the morning of a match and you can't face a bowl of porridge have your contingency there Go, I'm, I'm getting you know you like that you're getting the sliced pan out and you're going to have you're going to have your jam on it and you know that's that's just going to be just as good mm. um and that's that's match day prep and that's the level that I aim to get with, with all my players that come championship come match day championship that they are completely ready to go they have their strategy and also that has a powerful psychological boost as well for players that it's that confidence level going into a match that literally no stone has been left unturned and there's nothing that they couldn't have prepared any better, nothing more that they could have done, you know? Yeah, yeah. I think one thing that used to get me personally as well was if I didn't have protein that morning because I wasn't up to eating it, I used to feel bad because, you know, you have this thing in your head, you get protein because protein turns over, you have your protein turnover every day. Yeah. You think that you're going to fucking fade away if you don't have protein. Like, um, but... um yeah <clears throat> again if you can get something that you can just digest just get it into you and get on with it um it's, yeah. it's like it's it's a bit of tough love this mentally has worked well for me because i used to overthink games an awful lot I went through a period where i used to overthink them very badly like even if it was mm-hmm. a challenge i was, used to do it mm-hmm. to myself but one thing that has worked well from even my friends my own teammates is getting them to consume those high carb high calorie days the day before a game um, and I, even even by me saying go out, go out there and get yourself a burrito the night before, like even even by saying that to a few of the lads, they f- they mentally think that you know I'm I'm going to come into the game better now just because yeah. oh Doc said it to me, do you know what I mean? And it, that, yeah. like, that's that's psychologically powerful. So um, all these things that we're talking about, yes, they're fueling you the best way you can, but there's a massive psychological element to it too, mm-hmm. which pigeons holds into my next question. It came into my head there: caffeine around performance. Um, do you get most questions around coffee? Like I'm a big coffee drinker myself. Yeah. And we know coffee is, am I right in saying coffee is a laxative or is it, is it not that it's a laxative? It can stimulate, it stimulates, <laughs> it, st- it stimulates the bell. Yeah. Uh, and it does, that's essentially what it does. Yes, it, it, yes. it stimulates the bell and then, uh, it can just, it has a few, there's a few reactions that happen that stimulate mm. the bell and then, which why, excuse me, why it then leads to a bowel movement or want of one. So I, when I work with caffeine, and again, it is something I recommend, uh, you recommend to about roughly 200 megs, depending on your weight, that will be slightly adjusted, but roughly 200 megs for your average kind of team sport athlete player about an hour before. But a big thing, a big red flag always goes up when I give out this information to players that 
if you haven't, if you're not a coffee drinker and you've never had caffeine before, <laughs> don't do it for the first time before a match because you could end up <laughs> tailing it to the toilet like s- straight after the warm up or during the warm up yeah, or the yeah, match, yeah. you know? Like, truth be told, it, it happens to me pretty much uh, a lot. It happens to me a lot because <laughs> I am a coffee. The daily routine. I, yes. <laughs> the daily routine. I don't want to change. Like, I, I don't want to change my. Like we're talking about not changing routines in the match on the game day because you want to keep yeah. things less less stressful. So I normally keep my caffeine intake there, but it has backfired on me big time over yeah. the years. And I I I tied around with caffeine tablets last <clears> year. <throat> I don't know. I, I I feel like it's cheating in a little bit the way I love my cup of coffee, and I, I'm mm-hmm. a, I'm I would consider myself a coffee wanker these days because I, I, oh. I have no time. I have no time for shitty coffee anymore. Um, no. Life's too short like, for that, you know that. Yeah, like have you have you tried any other caffeine supplements? Like I, I've tried cans of Monster, but then I feel like it's just too much volume of liquid before a game. Uh, if I have it hours out, like it's different. Yeah. But like rock up the dressing with a can of Monster in my hand just doesn't do it for no. me. No, uh, it's too much. Um, yeah. And it's a lot of empty calories in it as well. Then I've tried the Monster that was like, is it called My Hydro Monster? It's uh, mm. like a t- tin bottle. Again, I just found it was too much fluid caffeine tablets yeah i could live with them but have you have you come across any other methods of uh getting your caffeine hit before a game i would work so three main things i use coffee strong coffee explaining to girls that like you know a caramel mocha frappuccino isn't ideally what i'm talking about i'm talking about a cup of strong black coffee or an espresso or double espresso 60 minutes before a game caffeine tablets after that being wary of dose because they are 200 mg each i had one girl tell me she was going to take two for the first time. So, you know, there's oh, a lot geez. of things. Don't do that. Yeah. Um, and then the other one would be caffeine chewing gum, which is a nicer way to take it for some people because it's a gradual intake, much like the same as a coffee would. Because remember with your tablet, it's 200 mg at one go. It's, you know, it, that absorption is similar across the 200 mg. So, you, you know, you're getting it as one dose rather than the coffee you'll drink over maybe five or 10 minutes. So it's a little bit more gradual. Mm. The, the tablets all at once but the chewing gum will have that similar effect if it's, it's the gradual intake so I have seen kind of higher success rates with players with the caffeine chewing gum rather than uh, for players who, who aren't caffeine um, or kind of used to caffeine so I would I would kind of rather players go coffee caffeine tablets in that order from my own experience nice. yeah. so I'm, I'm gonna uh, give that chewing gum a go now after hearing that yeah, yeah and it's not it's not too expensive and it's I would find having used all three after coffee because i i drink a good like it's not just a cup of coffee you're having for that stimulus effect it's a cup of very strong coffee because your average cup of coffee only has about 140 mg of medium strength so grand if you like high strength coffee or double espressos that could get you up to that 200 mg kind of dose that we're looking for but other than that you'd go with caffeine tablet or caffeine chewing gum and bear in mind as well that Although we know coffee doesn't have that seriously diuretic effect unless it's had at high concentrations, we do need to make sure that if you're having like a double espresso, that it may cause you to need to go to um, the toilet and, and urinate after it. So we need to just time it correctly as well, because as well as all the other hydration we're having, we need to make sure that we're mm. we're not having players having to run off the pitch to, to go to the toilet. So there's a few different things to, to bear in mind. Yeah. <clears throat> And uh, dressing room toilets are not the prettiest areas either. Let me no. just put that in there. <laughs> no. no, and then you could be out in a pitch that doesn't have dressing rooms nearby yes. or something like that. And then no toilet paper. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, what? What? Can do you know the what's the quote unquote caffeine recommendation for? Uh, is it performance? Is it like three to five megs per gram of body per weight kilo- or something like that? Yeah, per yeah. kilogram of body weight. It's rough right, three to yeah. six. Three to six, yeah. If I from three to six, we look so like for for the average, the two hundred gram. If you like, if seventy kilo athletes are in around two hundred and uh, it's about two hundred and ten migs, so we give that two hundred gram dose. Um, and that's I prefer to start at the lower end of the recommendation yeah. because, and and again, this is this is all happening in recent times because I'm back with teams and we're back and I'm one on one with them, which is great, but. I had a player try it for the first time the other night, came in for measurements and was literally shaking, shaking with the yeah. caffeine. And and that just was just mistimed and misdosed because the player wasn't used to caffeine and then went and took a 200 mig dose and felt very shaky. So 
you have to make sure that with any of these things, you're adjusting and readjusting and, and not going hell for leather on the first go at it, you know? Yeah, I've made that mistake too, where like I'm a habit, I'm a habitual, Jesus, I can't even say that word. I drink coffee a lot and, um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm very conscious of it. I know that I can downgrade uh, the effects of coffee, caffeine if I have too much. So mm-hmm. I have two cups a day. Now, yeah. whether I get that at home or from the local coffee shop, doesn't matter. I leave it at two. And then when I have a hard training week, so like my training is a phased approach in the gym. So like we have mm. kind of easier weeks and we build up to a tough week on your quote unquote tough week. Sometimes depending on my tiredness, I'll push the boundaries with an extra cup of coffee. It's the easiest way to do it for me to get that extra buzz. But lately I'm even wary of it because like recently enough, um, we were doing a squat session and uh, it was like more cup to your heavy set of three. I had two cups of coffee as normal. And an hour before I had a can of monster on top of it. And I thought I was going to have a heart attack like for the first 10 minutes mm. of that session. So I just did not feel right. And yeah. I think that's because my caffeine has been so on point and so steady. And then boom, yeah. it's like jack and double. Yeah. Like literally, I think it was double. Um, and I've recently tied with my normal two cups of coffee and then I might get a one shot flat white mm-hmm. um, an hour before and see how that's like. And I've nearly come to the conclusion of, I'd nearly prefer just to keep it at the two doses, but like yeah. maybe try and up those doses if I can do that. So like if I'm, ha- if I'm making a coffee in the house that morning and then two or three hours later, I'm having another one. I might try and just bring up that dose a bit more. And I'm going to apply that this year for game days and stuff. Like you said, have your cup of coffee, maybe have your chewing gum. But um, yeah, if if you don't drink caffeine, but maybe you drink an odd can of monster throughout a week, be very careful in your dosage. As Laura said, I'd say start on the lower end. And if you drink coffee a lot, you might need probably the lower end might, you know, yeah, be the, the best for you a little bit higher. Yeah. Your tolerance level is a little bit higher with caffeine. You will get that with, I see that with, with, with athletes all the time where, they just don't they don't feel that they're like all this you know the ergogenic boost that i'm talking about they're like, nah, don't feel it but and then they tell me they've been drinking coffee for the last 15 years and i'm like okay maybe you need a little bit more and a little bit closer to the session just a, a point to make around that as well david is that if you're somebody that doesn't uh, drink coffee and now wants to take caffeine be careful of it around training sessions that are late in the evening because you know, we know how important yeah. sleep is for recovery. And if, <clears throat> if like, I, I can't have a cup of tea after lunchtime because it will keep me up. So if a you're a little bit, yeah, <laughs> honest to God. So if you're caffeine yeah. sensitive like me and you, you know, take chewing gum or, or a caffeine um, tablet or like that a strong coffee, and then you're getting home, you feel buzzed for the training session. You felt like you did really well, brilliant. Get home and then you're wired on three o'clock in the morning. You don't want that either. So mm. you have to you have to find the balance again with with with, with another area of, of your nutrition that maybe you're timing the caffeine that you save it for match days or training on Saturdays or early morning training sessions. And all well and good, bring it in then, but just be mindful if you're having it at six o'clock and it's keeping you awake till two, that's counterproductive. So yes. you no, know, figuring out what's work, works best for you, I suppose. On any given day, like my caffeine would be finished before twelve. And then yeah. usually my I have later caffeine on a Saturday and Sunday because I'm usually a bit more lackadaisical like, um, yeah. but I'm still conscious on on weekends try and have it before two if I can because I do know it will affect me, and even little things like like obviously with COVID as well, um, it's like a lot of my Saturdays for us uh, a nice Saturday night out would be watching a film or watching an Netflix <laughs> series and maybe getting a takeaway and yeah. with the takeaway a Coke Zero. <laughs> And mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's a different thing to do. And I've, I, I, I do it every now and then still, but like I've actually changed my approach to that over the years because I used to find like having a Coke Zero in the evening, it's it's a big caffeine hit, whether you think it or not. There's actually a lot yeah. of caffeine in Coke Zero. And there's, there's more caffeine in tea than people realize. Let me let me say that as well. Uh, 100, I know, 100 I, mix, yeah. 50 yeah, like, to 100 uh, mix in tea. And that's 50 that's to 100, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I actually have a very good caffeine graphic, which took, took me hours upon hours. I took the, <laughs> took the data from examine.com yeah. and there was a merit. There's a very, very good American caffeine website. So I kind of, and basically put the two of them together and put a caffeine guide together. I'll put that in the show notes as well. And I might, I'll actually share it after this next week on the, on my very Instagram good. too. But yeah, I think the, the, like a basic cup of tea was around like 45, I think off the top of my head, but that can scale, that can double depending on the tea you're mm-hmm. having. Yeah. And if you're having six to seven cups of tea a day, you're having more than me in terms of caffeine. And you're wondering why you can't sleep at night. And 
funny on the tea we've actually started drinking decaf tea lately because my wife is pregnant she, that's she loves okay. tea so that's why she's brought it in and she knows then if she has her one coffee a day or if she has a can of coke zero that's her caffeine hit right there but if she's having two to four cups of tea a day as well on top of it it's not mm-hmm. adding that extra caffeine hit yeah and um, and now that we're drinking decaf i'm not a big tea drinker but i i, I do enjoy maybe an odd evening i'll have one um i don't notice a, d- a difference with decaf i know yes you'll have your avid coffee tea drinkers that tell me to go fuck myself but uh, <laughs> i think it's i think it's like the, it's it's like years ago when i changed from coke to coke zero i used to yeah. drink coke until it used to cut my ears like and okay. then i changed to coke zero um back when i had my clue about nutrition or didn't really care but when i changed to coke zero now i genuinely argue that coke zero is better than coke taste wise yeah I'll ar- i think i argue that it, point <laughs> it's adapted though I, I also switched to, to decaf tea in would you believe probably only three months ago oh, after nice. after 12 o'clock i, I drink decaf because like i would be especially when i'm working sitting down all day a tea is just nice go get the tea sit down it's, it's just a nice break up yeah. in the day um a nice have tea in the evening. I stopped having tea when I when I realized that actually it was keeping me awake. Because if you have a cup of very strong tea like that, it's anywhere up to potentially 100 megs, and it is averaging in a, like you said 40 to 50 megs per per cup. And it, people are having six a day. You're you're up around those higher caffeine intakes. Mm. So I just found switching over. I don't notice the difference. My dad will tell you otherwise because every time I bring him in a decaf tea, he hands the cup back to me, and he somehow <laughs> can tell he must be a tea connoisseur. But yeah, it's it, those little things. And, and people who drink, remember, green tea as well also yeah. has caffeine in it. So just be aware you're around those things. And I always come back to I am like a drill sergeant when it comes to sleep, encouraging people to sleep better. It's a huge health pillar that's completely forgotten about, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. And those little things that either impair your sleep or lower your quality of sleep, including yeah. the, the glass of wine before bed, anything like that needs to be taken into account we could we could have four or five podcast episodes on sleep alone and 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 yeah. tips and tricks and hacks and whatnot but yeah it's 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 massive and it's it's become a thing where i'm constantly in the quest for how can i improve it myself um even down to now anymore i don't i don't have shit pillows anymore like i used yeah. to i'm investing in good quality pillows now and i'm looking for you know um even if i find that my pit my pillows kind of getting a bit worn down i'll probably change it like little little things the room I think temperature that's called hitting your 30s as well though that yes I found that. definitely i give a shit about my th- yeah. <laughs> i give a shit about pillows and washing machines and dishwashers yeah, <laughs> yeah that i yeah. tell you i yeah. i did couldn't have cared like blinds or duvets didn't oh, yeah. you know yeah. didn't give a monkey's years ago and now i'm finding like that pillow doesn't suit me i'm gonna readjust it and buy a new one yeah. or buy a better better duvet or get blackout blinds like all of these things you don't consider yeah. yourself um <clears throat> or you don't consider them being important things but then when you you're hit with the hard fact that you spend a third of your life sleeping and it is a big determinant on how healthy you are mm. that you need to like we all but like you know our 20s are for not sleeping and i think then in your 30s yeah. you realize this is where actually and then you have kids david and it's all going to change again so. yeah yeah <laughs> but sure I, I i i live okay like um <clears throat> when we were both in college uh we moved in together and i think it was it was it two years i i was six i'm six for two like i'm not exactly small but two years we were in a single bed and I, I didn't care i didn't care but now now i'm like as you said I, I i give a shit about like i know about tread counts and sheets now like that's how yeah. bad i've got yeah. <laughs> anyhow um there's a, there's some brilliant stuff there and something that's been floating around my head for the whole episode is i wanted to like you were we were talking about dairy earlier on as well um uh, i wanted to just get it in there and because i don't <laughs> think people know this but is it skim milk or semi skim milk or something like that semi skim milk is the is the or is one of the most hydrating drinks you can have on earth. I love that you said that. I love that you know that. <laughs> it is. It, uh, skim milk or low fat milk is proven to be f- better at rehydrating after sport than, like Lucas said, sport or you know an, an equivalent isotonic drink and water. Mm. And th- when I say like I talk about milk and and low fat milk in in when I when I discuss recovery with clients and and with teams I work with and like my big thing is like it hits 
nearly all of your four recovery ores, you know, it, it rehydrates, it rehydrates, it refuels, it repairs and it replenishes. Mm. You know, it is effectively one of the best sports drinks, quote unquote, out there. And people hate, you know, when you when you bring things so simple to people, they nearly don't want to accept it because it's like, nah, that can't be right. It's because it, it's been under your nose the whole time. It's been mm. sitting there being being the best thing for you and just being in plain sight. And I don't think people are very reluctant to accept those things. It's nearly yeah. kind of it's it's nearly why I get players. Players are more likely to drink Muju for me than they are just plain low fat milk. And that's to do with taste and things like that. But they feel like Muju is more. I don't know. It, it's it's a little bit more fancy or is a little bit more pizzazz about it or even the, the, the protein milk. They, they don't want to accept this really simple thing could be so good for them and, and mm. you know, have that, have that, all of those, that, that replenishing, rehydrating, refueling and repairing effect on them. So, yeah, like, that's why I'm, I, I kind of, I encourage my players to drink milk so much. It's, it's a repetitive thing that it, mm. it's the most effective thing to have when I'm working with them, food provided with them. It's what I recommend they have available to them to take home. So, yeah, I'm I'm a bit of a milk advocate. I promise I'm not sponsored by anybody as well. <laughs> no, I, I'm the same. Like, I think, I, but I think I feel we're the same though because we like if if you look into the science behind dairy, it's it's mind blowing how good it is. Mm. And but yet you have people in the world saying that it's the worst thing ever, and only cows should drink it. Um, mm. It's yeah, it's a no brainer. It's like I'm a, I I know when I get to the end of a tough training session, and if it's a hot day. I literally crave a pint of milk and I just can't yeah, wait to get home to get that cold milk. Oh, oh my God. Now, if, if it's the case where, you know, you do ha- like, there are genuine dairy allergies out there. There's yeah. genuine dairy intolerances out there. You know, if you're lactose intolerant, if you have another allergy to, to a component of dairy, absolutely. You, you find alternatives and I encourage you to find appropriate alternatives. But what we what we more see is that people cut it out for no reason at all, other than they've been told it's bad for them, which is it's not the right approach to take with any part of your nutrition. Um, obviously, the, the, what's what was those misleading and, and false claims about dairy of it being pro-inflammatory? It's actually anti-inflammatory. That's what the research mm-hmm. has shown us, that it's actually like that. It has an anti-inflammatory effect in our body and therefore helps with recovery. So. You know, it is, it is I, I, anybody listening to this, if you have reduced or cut out dairy and you, you are playing sport or even for your general health, don't, you know, have a little bit more, um, I suppose that we look at it a, a little bit more kind of pragmatically where we're saying, okay, is this the best thing for me to do for my health? The issue with cutting out dairy is that we're often not what we see. And I'm sure you're very aware of this, that we cut out dairy, we take those key nutrients out of our diet such as you know what what the micronutrients that we have within dairy the the protein and and the carbohydrate and then we have a dairy alternative such as a nut a just flavored nut water is what i call it because it's not milk mm. and you you have those cashew almond soy or oat um oat mare, oat dairy alternatives and they don't contain the same amount of protein they don't contain the same amount of vitamins and minerals um you know calcium vitamin 12 and when we cut out dairy and we take out all those nutrients and we don't replace them we're then nutrient Mm. deficient in these areas because we haven't got that intake and that's where people drop the ball on it that's where people aren't uh, they're not aware of this is that's that's what's happening so we need to be if you are choosing to remove dairy if you hear from you know for ethical reasons or for um health reasons that you make sure that you're aware of the nutrients you need to replace them brilliant a point that I didn't foresee. I asked you earlier on, did you have any issues going back on dairy? Because I think, I don't know if I even said it, but when I did, I was a bit uncomfortable for a few weeks, mm-hmm. but I've, I remember looking into it at the time and I was like, because I haven't had dairy, my body wasn't producing the enzymes to break it down. And then when I reintroduced it, it took me a while to kind of get them back up and running. Yeah. Now, I don't know if that's pure and utter whatever, but um, I feel like I experienced that in some realm. I haven't looked into the science by that in a while. I could be wrong in what I just said, but I, I think it's there is potential. something there. Yeah, yeah, well, it, yeah. If you're if you're missing it in lactase to to digest, lactose. I think that was it. Yeah, but I just I haven't looked into that in years, so I, yeah. I, I I don't want to say something that I'm incorrect about. Um, because I'm always right. I'm always right. <laughs> <laughs> Same with myself. <laughs> yes, of course. And, um, Laura, where can people find out more about you? You can check out my Instagram, Bridge Nutrition, or my website, BridgeNutrition.ie. Perfect.
those will all be in the show notes anyway. And um, anything you'd like to leave this episode with, Laura? Uh, Nothing other than just don't overcomplicate your nutrition. Keep it simple and just take one meal at a time. Nice one. Thank you very much for coming on. Thanks very much, David. Appreciate it.